Welcome to A Look Ahead. As you may know, we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist General Conference Sabbath School Department uh, for the first quarter of 2013. And this is lesson four in that series entitled Creation, a Biblical Theme. We hope you have your Bible handy because we're going to look at a number of passages from Scripture, especially in the book of Genesis. And before we begin, we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we learn more about why we need to call you Father and what a privilege that is, help us to understand the words that are presented in these first few chapters of Genesis and why it's so important for us to understand our origins, where we came from, and all that that implies. May we came a, come closer to an understanding of that uh, today in our discussion together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're exploring the stories in the first four chapters of Genesis, and particularly today we're going to talk about how those stories are reflected by what is said in the rest of Scripture. Did the prophets of the Old Testament, the writers of the Old Testament, even the writers of Psalms, the, 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 the song composers, and the, the apostles of the New Testament, including Jesus himself, did they give evidence that they really believed the stories in Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 and 4? That's really the question we want to try to answer today. So. Let's jump in. As Seventh-day Adventists, we have claimed the three angels' messages as our final truth to spread to the world. Notice that the first angel begins with the challenge for us to worship God, quote, who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Uh, just take a look at that real quick. Then I saw another angel flying. This is Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth. To every race, tribe, language, and nation, he said in a loud voice, Honor God and praise his greatness, for the time has come for him to judge. Worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. Are we, as presumably, hopefully, faithful Seventh-day Adventists, are we impacting the world in any way and that giving that message? Are we convincing people or are more and more people being unconvinced about that message? Well, how do you convince them? <laughs> That's one of the questions. How do we convince people? Well, the scriptures as we have them today were written over a period of about 1,600 years. There's no way that the writers could have collaborated together to try to promote some false teaching. They just I mean, from Moses to the, to the Apostle John, 1,600 years separated them. Is it possible that Moses had such an influence on later writers that they quoted him even without believing that what he said was true? Do you think this could be a giant conspiracy of some kind? Well, Moses certainly had a lot of influence on the writers, mm -hmm. well, on the whole nation of Israel mm -hmm. and, and all the writers. Um, but I, I think there's more than that. You don't think that was enough to convince them but to continue a conspiracy? No. Well, what, what's the other option that they would go for? If you're thinking that they're following the lines of Moses, what would be the other option? Well, they could say, if this is a falsehood, as our evolutionary friends claim, yeah, okay. they could have said, they could have said, you know, we, we don't, Jesus himself could have said, you know, Moses slightly misled you. It really ought to be like this. Well, what would be like this? Because, well, because evolutionists will, will say that it's because of our ignorance that we, we, we put this on God. Okay. That God, that when you don't understand, you just have to make up a God that does it all by magic. Yeah. So, um, how, so are you, how, are, how is looking through the Bible going to convince them Okay, just because they're, they're all ignorant. As as my is. response is, there are a lot of them who claim to be Christians. And they, pr they would like to sort of chop off the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And then the rest of the Bible, they more or less believe. What I'm going to show you today, what we're going to see today is, you can't do that. 
If, if, if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna throw out the first eleven chapters of Genesis, you're gonna have to get rid of huge sections of scripture. You're not gonna have a Bible left. So okay. that's your choice. Are you gonna throw out the Bible completely, or are you gonna accept? So yes. you're saying that being a Christian and not believing in creation is disingenuous. I'm saying if you claim to believe the Bible then you're committed to believing in a creation story. Is there, uh, is there any empirical evidence for, to, to prove the cre a creation, a, a biblical creation? Uh, well, what, and, and okay. I mean, that, it appears to me that's what science is looking okay, for, okay, is, is empirical, and, yeah. and yeah. you know, the only thing that we have, it would appear to me, Unless there's some avenues that I don't know about, is is this book and just reading this and no, no, and what seems to make sense? No, that's not true. We, I'm hoping to get. In fact, I'm quite sure we'll get before this quarter is open over a someone here that's an expert in that field, and we'll have a chance to ask our questions. The 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 facts are, insofar as you can have facts on such a subject, the facts are that. Everybody has the same amount of evidence. There's the, there's the layers, there's the, you know, the fossils, there's all, all sides have exactly the same hard evidence to look at. The difference is in interpretation. So it's, and, and this is a, a mistake that Christians must never allow themselves to fall into. Do not allow your, creation, your evolutionist friends to say, well, you have the Bible and we have science. That is not true. We have, we have an interpretation of the Bible and we have an interpretation of scientific facts that differs from theirs. They have an interpretation of scientific facts and that is their Bible. It's their interpretation. It's not science versus the Bible. It's, it's here's all the evidence. You have your interpretation, we have our interpretation, and ours is based on scripture. I'm not sure what yours is based on, but it's, that's the difference. It's, it's, it's interpretation versus interpretation. It's not science versus the Bible. But, but the, the, the thesis of, of evolution is, is, a, is a progression of, of uh, development of life. And we're going to talk about but, that. But, but not it's, uh, I'm not a scientist here, so I've got to be careful that I, um, but it, 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 to go back to the origin, mm -hmm. to say where things actually started, mm -hmm. um, is, th is there any, I don't even think evolutionists say they have scientific evidence for, for that. They kind of go back to the Big Bang or some instant place that they can't go beyond. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. <coughs> There's it, a Romanian church yeah. that gives out a uh, DVD of a, a scientist in Romania that takes the evidence that mm. scientists have for evolution and uh, explains and shows how it can't be evolution, and it's an excellent one. Also here in Loma Linda, we have, uh, I've heard many good speakers uh, talking about uh, s a scientific interpretation uh, that uh, goes along with the Bible. What's the name of our institute? The Geo. The Geoscience Research Institute. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, you chose the first eleven chapters yes. of Genesis. Yes. Because you wanted to include the flood. I'm yes. Sure. Yes. Now. Because, that, because that's the part they usually want to throw out. Well, see, th that's what we have evidence for. Mm -hmm. They go back before the flood. Th there's not a lot of data. Okay, so we, we, we sort of assume that anything as gigantic or catastrophic as the flood, if that could have occurred, if the Bible's story is true on that, mm -hmm. then it's not much of a step to assume creation as described in the Bible. Yeah. So we're talking about the flood when we're talking about data and evidence rather than creation itself. Yes and no. Uh, by and large, I would agree with you. Now, our, uh, let's be honest. We're not talking about the creation versus evolution primarily here today. What we're trying, the, the, the discussion we're having today, because we have several weeks to talk about this, 
the discussion we're having today is, can you separate those, I don't care if you choose the first four chapters, but I, I choose, to choose, to choose the first 11 chapters of Genesis, can you cut it off from the rest of your Bible and, and, and end up with a, with a viable document? And my answer to that is no. That's a different question. I understand yeah. that. Yeah. Did Jesus talk about creation then? Well, that's, let's, let's go there and let's look. Let's look at some places. There's indirect and there's direct evidence for belief in creation. Take, for example, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. The God who said, out of darkness the light shall shine, is the same God who made his light shine in our hearts to bring us the knowledge of God's glory shining in the face of Christ. Now, the God who said, out of darkness let the light, the light shall shine, that's an indirect reference to creation. So if you are not a person who believes in creation, you should black out that verse. Well, you've you got a problem with that verse, yes. Look at Hebrews 4.4. 4. Here's a much more blatant one. For somewhere in the scriptures, this is said about the seventh day, God rested on the seventh day from all his work. Where does that come from? Creation. First four chapters of Genesis. So... Well, Right. Are we talking about public and private evidence? Because let's say what I know about God, I know, and I can, it's not transferable to anyone else. Mm -hmm. I know it because I believe the Bible and because God chooses to connect with me and mm -hmm. I believe in what I believe. Mm -hmm. And someone else who believes strictly in one and one is two and what they can repeat mm -hmm. and test and what have you. That's the, that's the public evidence because they can do it again and again. Yeah. My evidence is a private evidence. Yeah. And okay. Well, and one of the other issues, and we're going to talk more about this later, but let, just, let me mention it just quickly right now. There are two huge challenges with respect to creation. The first one is creation is a singularity. You know what a singularity is? It happened once. Happened. Yeah, it only happens once. It doesn't, doesn't keep repeat it. You can't repeat it. So scientists, a lot of scientists want to throw, if you say anything's a singularity, we want to throw it out. My challenge to them was if you were going to throw out every singularity, then we have to throw out the Big Bang. And then they have no explanation for origins, none whatsoever. So this can play both sides, you see. The second problem is if you believe the creation story, it's entirely a story based on the supernatural. And they, want, they don't want to have anything to do with supernatural. They want to say, okay, I want to put it in my lab in front of me, and I want to experiment with it. Don't talk to me about supernatural. So if, if you're going to throw out the supernatural, and you're going to throw out singularities, you're in a soup. You don't, I mean, you're, you're going to have to throw out the Big Bang, too. So I don't know where you're going to go from there. Another word for supernatural, could it be God's miracles? Yeah. It's a miracle. Something, something that's done by somebody apart from this earth. Okay. You know, the reason, though, that they want to repeat their experiments is to show that it's true. Yeah. I mean, history, there's a lot of history you can't repeat, and it's going to be interpretation no matter what, forever. But if you have an experiment yeah. that you can actually say that it's going to happen if you mix these things right a certain way and it's going to do this thing and it happens every time that's no interpretation that's going to actually okay. be the truth but you see if you take that approach are you going to say that by definition all history is false no 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 i'm just okay, saying so that there's, a, there's a different yeah there's no, I understand. science science draws a line right there it, it talks about physical things but it wants to be able to to um, re reproduce things, just to, to use that as a proof that it's the truth. Whereas history, um, you have a little bit of problem there. You can't reproduce it. You're going to have to take it by faith. Could it be that scientists love things they can control? Yes. And you can't control? Well, you've got to control it. If you don't have it under control, well, then all kinds of things could sneak in and cause things to, to happen differently. Well, but here's, truth, here's the truth doesn't have to be controlled by scientists in order to be true. No, and no, that's not what they're saying. When you go into science, that's the area that, that you're in. There is a lot of things besides what science can talk about. Yeah. And, and physical science <coughs> physical has been science. very successful 
in, in lots of things. You just take out your iPhone or look yeah. at the pictures of the lunar landing. That those are things which scientists have, have learned progressively mm -hmm. by uh, experiment and repetition. Mm -hmm. But that is different than what they call historical science. Yes. Because nobody was back there at the flood. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, are still around anyhow. And nobody was there on day three of creation or day four. So that is historical and that is not experimental science. Oh. That is hypothesis and argument. That is how many people, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? <laughs> well, many modern scholars, skeptics and theologians believe that the book of Genesis was put together Let's be honest about this. By the way, before I leave the science business, let us remember that there's a whale of a lot of science that's based on statistical truth, statistical truth, if you will, which means that the scientific facts, 5% of them are wrong. That's the way we, we do statistics. 5% of them are wrong. So don't tell me that science is fact because I can tell you, I mean, I'm in the field of medicine. And I, I practice medicine based on the scientific facts, recognizing all the time that 5% of what I'm talking about is guaranteed to be wrong. There may be even more than that, but 5% is guaranteed to be wrong. And that's a statistical fact? That's a statistical fact. But if you go to the um, interpretation of history, how much of that is wrong? Well, I mean, I think it's way more than 5%. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, it, the, the history happened. Yeah. And it happened precisely, I mean, it happened in a certain way, and you can't change the fact that it happened in that way. You can go back and redo it, or you can try to redo it. You can't change the fact that history happened in a certain way. Are you sure now, that's a fact? That's a fact. Uh, or is you, that just an interpretation that you okay, have Okay, well, that's the point. The, 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 the variations now come in how you interpret that history. There are variations in interpretation. There's not a, I mean, there's a fixed number of people who died in World War II. You can argue about who caused it, who was responsible, da da da. You can argue all kinds of stuff. But those, there was a certain number of people who died. There was a certain number of attacks made. There were a certain number of bombs made. Those things are facts. We may not know those numbers, but there, it, the, the facts are there. Yeah. There was okay. a reality, or there is a reality. There is a reality. There was a reality back at the flood. There was mm -hmm. a reality uh, at, at creation. Now, how do we prove that? Yeah. How do we go back and examine it? With all and that is conjecture. With all the variations of possibilities, you know, with the evidence you have, and even with the, what the Bible says, mm -hmm. there's a lot of possibilities there that, that could be interpreted. Okay. I'm, I'm still not convinced, Ken, that these other Bible writers weren't influenced by Moses and... Okay, hold on. Uh, and and, I'm, and I'm, I'm saying that's a possibility. Are you going to say that they were deceived? What are you going to say if a whole bunch of Bible writers are deceived? Well, what are you going to say? Better be careful. Was because that, and that's the next question. You're going to say Jesus was also deceived. You better be really careful where you go there. Because there are certainly some things that Moses said that Jesus said, Moses, you've been told this, but I tell you this. Yeah. He didn't say that about creation. No. Well, you know, there are enough feisty Bible people and the Brians um, and uh, Martin Luther who thought for themselves that if there was something that wasn't right and true, um, I don't think, and, and they risked their life for this. You're not going to risk your life for something someone said way back if you know it's not true. Yeah. So it... Well, l let's look at the evidence. Let's, we need to progress here. Okay. There are a lot of people who believe that the book of Genesis was not written by Moses that was written by a bunch of different authors, that somebody slapped it together, and then editors came along and tried to patch it up. They talk about E sources based on the biblical name for God, which is Elohim. They talk about J sources based on the biblical name for Jehovah. They firmly believe that Genesis 1 was written by one author, while Genesis 2, especially starting with verse 4, was written by a completely different author, and that those two accounts cannot be fully reconciled with each other. So we need to recognize that these and there are people who believe this. Are they Christians? Oh yeah, they, well they claim to be, yeah. It's interesting to notice in that respect that, and here's Jesus' evidence of some of it, look at Matthew 19. 
Jesus answered, haven't you read the scripture that says in the beginning the Creator made, male, made people male and female? And God said, for this, ra oh, I'm sorry, God, the Creator made people male and female. Which chapter does that come from? Genesis 1. Genesis 1. <clears throat> and God said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and unite with his wife and the two will become one. What chapter does that come from? Genesis 2. Genesis 2. And Jesus puts them together. He sees no separation from these two whatsoever. He goes on to say, so they are no longer two but one. No human being must separate then what God has joined together. So it's not an allegory, huh? Not would, an allegory. Um, would p Christians who wanted people to be gender neutral want, have difficulty with that passage also? Maybe. It is so you're saying that... that um, these aren't parts put together because how would they be connected to each other by referring to each other? Is that what you're saying? Well, there are a lot of people who try to look at these two things and say they're as different as can be. There's no way you can put them together. And I'm saying Jesus just did it. Well, well you, can, you can't put them together. That means they don't see the, the links. No. They don't see any links, but there are links. So well, Jesus, Jesus thought so. Jesus put several yeah. chapters of Genesis together, so they, they go together. Well, I, that's the way I read it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, is, is it essential? I mean, let's ask these tough questions. Now, let's not, we could just go on asking questions and raising doubts all morning long or all <laughs> evening for long. It is essential in our Christian beliefs to regard all part. is it essential to regard all parts of Scripture as equally inspired? Could a passage be partly inspired? Could we discount the truthfulness of re or reality of Genesis 1 through 11 and still regard the rest of Scripture as fully inspired? So that's our question. That's what we were trying to struggle does, with. Does the Bible give any guidance on if it was all inspired or partially Well, inspired? there are verses in the Bible that say it's all inspired. But you have to be very careful how you use those because you can prove way too much with that, those kind of verses. There are verses that we've talked about, such as Paul said, oh, remember to bring my coat. Mm -hmm. You know, that <coughs> didn't need inspiration to do that. And no, but it's so in maybe Scripture. Maybe there are some that are partly inspired. One, one uh, argument is the allegory argument. That's a very big argument. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you get back over in the New Testament and Jesus starts talking in these very specific ways, it's... It's, it's hard to stick with that allegory argument that Genesis was just a bunch of, just an allegory. Well, look at Genesis 2. We, we're, we've pretty much covered Genesis 1. Genesis 2, and so the whole universe was completed. I'm reading from the Good News Bible. By the seventh day, God finished what he'd been doing and stopped working. That's what it means he rested. He stopped working. He blessed the seventh day and set it apart as a special day because by that day he had completed his creation and stopped working. And that is how the universe was created. Going on, when the Lord God made the universe, there were no plants on the earth, no seeds had sprouted because he had not sent any rain and there was no one to cultivate the land. But water would come up from beneath the surface and water the ground. Then the Lord God took some soil from the ground and formed a man. Out of it, he breathed life-giving breath into his nostrils and the man began to live. Then the Lord God planted a garden Eden in the east, and there he put the man he had formed. He made all kinds of beautiful trees grow there and produce good fruit. In the middle of the garden stood the tree that gives life and the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. So they were, those two trees were close to each other in the middle of the garden. A stream flowed forth, and it talks about how it divided up. Then the Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and guard it. He said to him, You may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. And so forth. Um, then it talks about, and we'll, we'll get more into this, talks about how he named the animals and then he created Eve. So, uh, what are we supposed to learn from that chapter? Humans were put in charge of everything else. Mm -hmm. Were made in God's image. What does that mean? How, Adam, ca how carefully God designed everything yeah. and uh, made it fit for Adam. Mm -hmm. Why does it sound like Genesis 2, after you get started, is repeating the creation story again, only a different way? Because he wants to emphasize different points. 
I think that Genesis 2, well, Genesis 1 is the overview, mm -hmm. and Genesis 2 is focusing especially on how man was created. Mm -hmm. But um, it's kind of missing a lot of things. That's what happens. That's all, what always happens. You've got a big story, and then you say, okay, I want to talk more about this. What are you doing? You're, you're missing all that part out there that you're not focusing on, aren't you? It's always like that. Yeah, and it, and it also says that um, things didn't grow because God didn't send rain. Mm -hmm. On the yeah. land. On the land. Yeah. But that was when God started creating. It says that mm -hmm. he didn't send, send um, rain, so nothing grew. So it's, it sounds like there was nothing on the earth because there's no water. It was a drought. Well, no, he, he goes on the next few verses said the water came up from underneath. No, Maybe. but then why would there be a drought if there was water coming up from? Nobody said there was well, a drought. I wouldn't call it a few does. Days it, my of, Bible of says no there was a drought. drought. I it wouldn't was, call a few days of no rain a drought. Well, no, days, no, it says that there was no plants coming up because there was no rain. The water, and then there was water underneath coming up. I believe. But it also then why? Why would he even no mention that? Till the ground at that time also. The water right. was in its place, and the land was in its place, and then God developed a drip system. For the land. Well, yeah, but he said the reason why the plants did not grow was because there was no rain and there was nobody to farm it at that time. Where are you getting The that? water was still it's, in... It says in Genesis, um, <coughs> Genesis 2, after, right after the... Uh, 2, two um, 4, and 5. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. Keep going, Ken. I want to... Uh, I want some more evidence here that, yeah. that Genesis just isn't. Well, let, let's look at, um, the purpose here is to try to see whether Genesis, <clears throat> the first chapters of Genesis fit with the rest of Scripture. That's what we're supposed to be talking about. Psalm 8 talks all about the creation. O Lord, our, our Lord, your greatness is seen in all the world. Your praise reaches to the, up to the heavens. It is sung by children and babes. You're safe and secure from all your enemies. You stop anyone who poses you. When I look, but this, look up at the sky which you have made, at the moon and the stars which you set in their places, what are human beings that you think of them? And it goes on. That's now that we have it in Psalm. Psalm 104. It not only mentions that God created all these things, but it mentions it in exactly the same order as Genesis does. Does that tell us anything? Um, How long after Genesis were the Psalms written? Well, there, there's a lot of argument about that. The very shortest period of time would be that, assuming that Genesis, happen, Gen, that, that Genesis 1 happened about 4,000 years before Christ, uh, the Psalms are written about 1,000 years before Christ. So there'd be at least 3,000 years in between there. But the at, writing was from Moses until yeah. Yeah. a lot of David and so on. Of course, once again, it could be argued that they got their information from Genesis. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are many other passages in the Psalms that clearly indicate that the authors believe in creation, and we don't have time to read nearly all these. Psalm 24, 1 and 2. A famous one is Psalm 33, 6 and 9. The Lord created the heavens by His command, the sun, moon, and stars by His spoken word. Then drop down to verse 9. When He spoke, the world was created. At His command, everything <coughs> appeared. I mean, does that Bible writer seem to suggest that he believes in creation? Yes. And then another major area is in, in Job. Now, you need to understand what's going on in Job. There's a very interesting set of passages. As you remember, it starts out with God and the devil, apparently in the courts of heaven, having a discussion about Job. And God gives the devil permission to decimate Job's family and crops and, and animals and everything, they're all gone. And Job still is faithful to God. And so then he's, the devil says, well, let me touch Job. So he sends him in the worst disease he can possibly think of. But he's not allowed to kill him. And Job still is in <coughs> defending God. And then there's those cycles of discussions between Job's friends and Job, back and forth. And they go on and on. Finally, you get down to, to chapter 29 to, to 31, and you see Job's final defense. And he basically in those chapters he says, oh, if I could just get back to the way it was before, that God and I were friends, we talked to each other, everything was going so well, etc. If we could just be like that again. Is this where he made the famous thing, even though he slay me, 
Well, that's actually earlier. Oh, but, okay. Yeah. But yes, he, he, that's one of the statements he made. Then there comes up this young upstart by the name of Elihu, and he takes up chapters 32 to 37 just saying, you're spouting all kinds of nonsense, Joe. What in the world are you talking about? You, you know, you, and on and on he goes on. Five, six chapters worth. And then it's very interesting. God speaks up, and what does God say? Where were you when I created? Yeah, and he starts talking about creation. And nobody before that has talked about creation. Job 38 to 41, God talks about creation. Look just a few of those verses, especially beginning with chapter 38, the first few verses. Then out of the storm, the Lord had spoke to Job. Now, the previous six chapters, remember, were Elihu. And Job's three chapters were before that, and then the discussions were before that. The Lord, quote, Who are you to question my wisdom with your ignorant, empty words? Now stand up straight and answer the questions I ask you. Were you there when I made the world? If you know so much, tell me about it. Who decided how large it would be? Who stretched the measuring line over it? Do you know all the answers? Who holds the pillars that support the earth? And that's what they believed in those days. They believed that nothing could be held up unless something solid was holding it up. It's a, it's a, a reflection of their beliefs. Uh, who laid the cornerstone of the world? In the dawn of that day, the stars sang together, and the heavenly beings shouted for joy. Now, this is an example of Hebrew parallelism. Stars goes together with heavenly beings, and sang goes together with shouted for joy. So, who are these heavenly beings? Well, we believe these are angels. We believe that they are beings from other parts of the world, the ones that were talked about back in chapter 1 and 2, right? Who closed the gates to hold back the sea? And he goes on. Okay. The interesting part is that Job, after that, long discussion. Uh, what does Job say? Do you remember? Shut my mouth. Yeah. Look at Job 42. Then Job answered the Lord, I know, Lord, that you're all powerful, that you can do in everything you want. You ask how I dare question your wisdom when I'm so very ignorant. I talked about things I did not understand, about marvels too great for me to know. You told me to listen while you spoke and to try to answer your questions. In the past, I knew only what others had told me, but now I have seen you with my own eyes, so I'm ashamed of all I have said and repent in dust and ashes. And God said, finally, Job, I put you in your place. Is that what he said? Well, look at the next two verses. And the Lord had, after the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, now he'd spoken to Job, Job responded, now he turns to Job's friends, he says, I am angry with you and your two friends because you did not speak the truth about me as my servant Job did. In fact, now take seven bulls and seven rams to Job and offer them as a sacrifice for yourselves. Job will pray for you and I will answer his prayer and not disgrace you as you deserve. You did not speak the truth about me as he did. Who was the one who spoke the truth about God? And who was the one who was misleading people about God and had the wrong picture? Job's friends, right? So what does that have to do with the creation part? Well, God, God comes down and he speaks to people who are arguing about all kinds of craziness, about who's responsible for what and whether or not you should be punished because you're a sinner, all that kind of stuff. And God says, let me speak. And what's the basis for my ability to speak? I created the world. All, a whole list of created it's, things. It goes on and on. Four chapters. <laughs> okay. You want me to read all four chapters? <coughs> no, no, no. I was, just, I was just wondering why he was, he, was, he was doing that to show people who they actually were. There was just right. no way that, that they could have seen all that. So how could you be so smart? Yeah. I mean, God is just saying there, look. I am the sovereign of the universe. I created everything. And whoever wrote Job, and I happen to believe it was Moses, clearly recognized that God was speaking as the creator. Was God using empirical evidence here to validate? I mean, wasn't he saying, look at all this stuff you can yep. see and touch and feel and smell? Mm -hmm. You know, what's very interesting is God wanted people to tell the truth about him. Mm -hmm. And the people who didn't tell the truth about him, he didn't appreciate. God says he's creator. That's the truth about him. Does he appreciate Christians who say 
he is not the creator. Would that be like Job's mm. friends? Yeah. You know, I'm not pleased with you. You need to say the truth about me. I am the creator. Okay, so what we have seen now is there's a huge chunk of Job that talks about God as a creator, and there's no question about him being the creator. Let's go to Isaiah. You go from Isaiah 40 to 55, and there are two huge arguments. There, there are some smaller arguments. But there are two huge arguments that, you know, in, in effect, in those chapters, God says, well, the real God, please stand up. And how do you identify the real God versus all the phonies? One, the real God can create out of nothing. And two, the real God can predict the future far in advance. There's another huge chunk of scripture that says, hey, here's the evidence. I, well, go ahead. I found a wonderful part of Genesis 2 is that not only does God create, but he, with creating people in his own image means they're able to do wonderful things. When we look at around, I pick up a cell phone and I speak with my brother who's in France and I hear his voice like he was standing right next to me. It is definitely my brother. I am in awe. But people take that, they think they become demigods because of the things they're able to do from what God created. But there's a limit to what they can create. That's why I don't understand why people want to fight guides so much because they're able to do a little something. We're, we're going to talk about why that. Yeah. The real bottom line to all that is they don't want to face the fact that one day God is going to call them into judgment. And they don't want to have anything. They want to live their lives free and flippant and however they want. They don't want anyone to challenge whatever they want to do. And when someone tries to challenge, says, look, you know, someday all that's going to be brought up in judgment. They say, away with you. So you believe everybody that don't believe in God thinks that? I think, no, I don't, no. I think there's a lot of people who don't think. No, 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 no. <laughs> there's a lot of people that do think. And those who do think very well, but they don't believe in God. Well, and those people are wrong. I know they're wrong. Mm -hmm. But I'm not so sure if they're doing that just because they're worried about somebody judging them later. The huge people, if you look at the thought leaders down the last couple hundred years and why they rejected God and why they're accepting our Darwinian kind of evolution, the real basis behind that was rejection of the church and rejection of God behind the church. They wanted freedom. They said, we don't want to be responsible for but you know, at that to anybody. Point, don't you think that there's a reason for that? The church was not acting very godly back then. I'm not arguing about that one tiny little bit. Um, let, let's go on. That's not what we're trying to prove right now. We've already suggested that Job really wasn't raising any questions about creation, but God said, this is one of my arguments. I was the creator. And Job I mean, think how much better off we should be and try to understand God than Job was. Job had no Bible. He had no pastor. He had no church. He had no study groups. He had nothing. He had only his personal relationship with God to go by. Look, look at all the advantages we have. See, more than that, we live on which side of the cross? We live a couple thousand years on this side of the cross. We have all that evidence that Job never ever heard of. So, look at what else, well, part of what Isaiah said in those 15 chapters I recommended to you. How long did Job live after Adam died? Well, or we don't know Job, exactly when or Job, Job lived. did Job talk to Adam? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, Job's after the flood. Yeah, Job was long after the flood. Job was probably approximately in the days of Abraham. That would be somewhere around the year 2000 B.C. And questionable about the flood. Um, Usher's chronology, which has a lot of flaws in it, but it's a general outline. The Usher's chronology would put the flood around 2348 BC. So that's 350 years before Abraham. 350 years between the flood and the Abraham, the beginning of the Abraham story, more or less. So the world wasn't largely Christian. Well, there was nobody Christian in those days. I they mean, were, um, God. Um, well, they started out like that until they got to the Tower of Babel and decided they were going to defy God. Yeah. yeah. Well, look at 
Isaiah 45, 18. The Lord created the heavens. He is the one who is God. He formed and made the earth. He made it firm and lasting. He did not make it a desolate waste. There's your desert, Gary. But a place for people to live in. It is he who says, I am the Lord and there is no other God. Now, I, that's pretty blatant, I would say. That's pretty, I mean, he feels pretty strongly about that. Clearly, God intended for this earth to be inhabited by creatures like us. No other planet in our solar system is fit for human habitation. Three quarters of our world is covered with water, an essential element for human life. Our air is a safe mixture of 21% oxygen and 78% nitrogen. Other planets, even in our solar system, are very hot, and the air consists primarily of carbon dioxide or helium. We couldn't live there without some kind of a spacesuit, even if, and maybe not even then. Furthermore, our Earth with this temperature-modulating atmosphere, suitable for, suitable for terrestrial <laughs> life, does not get too hot or too cold, except possibly at the poles. As we've suggested before, there are many, many other factors that make this planet suitable for human habitation. Okay. So if you're, gonna, if you're going to say that this Earth is an accident, you've got to have a whole lot of very, very special accidents mm -hmm. to bring. I mean, I've seen movies, multiple movies made by people who believe in evolution about how this world was created by, you know, asteroids smashing into each other and so forth. And the question I would ask them is, if you take this Earth, and if you could shrink it down to the size of a billiard ball, it would be smoother than the billiard balls that you can buy at the store. How do you get something like that out of two asteroids smashing together? Or 10, I don't care how many, pick how many. How do you get a perfectly smooth billiard ball out of that kind of collision? Are you speaking of the Earth underneath the mountains? No, I'm talking about the Earth as it is. Those mountains. Com com compared to the total size of the Earth, oh. those mountains amount to nothing. Okay. When you shrink I mean, we're talking 8,000 miles, and we're talking about two or three miles up there in variation. Yes, that shows me about how much I amount to. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you don't think that if things crashed together that it wouldn't turn out smooth? I'm asking you, what do you think? you got a science project, Gary. <laughs> well, there's, there's a possibility, there's a possibility, a, a faint possibility, that when those things crash together, they, everything turns so hot that it all turned into a liquid. And that it happened to be lucky enough to be spinning around in a circle, and somehow around that spinning, which normally would have produced an oval shape, I mean, it should, it should shh out in the middle and shh down at the top, and it does a little bit of that. The Earth is actually slightly bigger around the middle than it is around that way. Slightly. If it's been a little more, it'd be more. Yeah. <laughs> Are you okay. saying that Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, Jonah, and Zechariah all mention creation? Yes. In, the, in these verses of prophets, and there they are. By the way, if you want to get our handouts that we use here, they're available on our website. It's theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. There we have Isaiah 44, 25, 24, 45, 12, Jeremiah 51, 15 and 16, Amos 4, 13, Jonah 1, 9, and Zechariah 12, 1. In these verses we see that the prophets recognized that God created everything in the universe and that he created us. He created stars, he created mountains, day, night, land, and sea, and gave life to human beings. More than that, he communicates with human beings. He has made his thoughts known to us. What are the implications of having such a creator as a friend? Now we're talking real challenges. If we as a human race are just the final step in an evolutionary process, then we have nothing to look forward to in the future. When we die or are torn apart by superior beings or animals or whatever, that will be the end of our existence. How does that make you feel? Isn't it so much better to realize that the God who created us also has a wonderful plan for our future? What's interesting is if God is the creator, God has a very original creative mind, mm -hmm. and he cares about us. So if we have a problem, we should ask our creator for a creative solution. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And God should be glad to give a creative solution to our problems mm -hmm. because He is a creator. But we've talked about the Old Testament. Let's look now at the That's New Testament. That's what I do. <laughs> Let's look at the New Testament. Look at Acts 17, starting with verse 22, for example. Paul stood in front of the city council. Now, this is Paul's first appearance at Athens in ancient Greece. And he's, he's preaching things on the street corner. And they say, man, we've never heard anything like this before. Come over to the Areopagus, the center of debate in the city, and tell us what you have to say. So he stands in front of the city council and he said, I see that in every way you Athenians are very religious. For as I walked through your city and looked at the places where you worship, I found an altar on which is written to an unknown god. Now, there's some very interesting reasons why they had unknown gods, but we don't have time for that now. That which you worship then, even though you do not know it, is what I now proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, bingo, he's a creator, is Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples made by human hands. And he's looking up at the Parthenon, okay? Nor does he need anything that we can supply by working for him, since it is he himself who gives life and breath and everything else to everyone. From one human being he created all races on earth and made them live throughout the whole earth. He himself fixed beforehand the exact times and the limits of the places where they would live. He did this so that they would look for him and perhaps find him as they felt about for him. Yet God is actually not far from any one of us. As someone has said, in him we live and move and exist. It is as some of your poets have said, we too are his children. I mean, Paul basically, in his sermon to the Athenians, basically covered all of creation, didn't he? Was he referring to the Tower of Babylon when um, he says that he separated the people and uh, made them into groups? Well, what happened as a result of that, yes. Yeah. Well, he was speaking to people who weren't so familiar with the Hebrew Scriptures. And I think he made a very compelling case. Consider some other New Testament passages which show a clear belief in the creation story. We already looked at Matthew 19, 46, what Jesus himself said. And look at Mark 2, 27 and 28. After, and Jesus concluded, the Sabbath was made for the good of human beings. They were not made for the Sabbath, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Does that have a creation kind of ring to it? Yes. Not, not kind of a ring, that's spot on. <laughs> spot on. Luke 3, 38. The son of Enosh, now this is, if it talk, he's, now he's talking in Luke 3, if you go starting with what is about 23 or something, it starts talking about the, the, the genealogy of Jesus and counts back and it goes to verse 38, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. You know, it's pretty clear uh, what he believes, isn't it? It's interesting as you read these New Testament passages of these contemporaries of Jesus and that they lived in a world that uh, had all kinds of yep. theories about how, um, how the creation of man had, had occurred. Yeah. The Greeks had ideas. The Romans had uh, ideas. And, and let, let's just mention one of those very quickly. We've talked about this before. But one of the, the, the Greek pantheon starts out with, you know, having a, a, a battle between a couple of gods and one god destroys the other one and tears the other god apart, throws part of it here and part there and part becomes ocean and part becomes land and, you know, what kind of a, what kind of a creation story is that? But, but it was a creation story that was contemporary and a lot of people believe, they really believe that's how it all happened. Yeah. Well, one very famous passage that talks about in terms of creation is John 1, 1 to 3. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was God. From the very beginning, the Word was with God. Through Him, God made all things. Not through evolution, through Him. Not one thing in all creation was made without Him. The Word was the source of life, and this life brought light to humanity. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never put it out. Now, and it goes another, on. <clears throat> another word for Jesus is the Word, correct? Yes. So he's speaking about Jesus when he says the yeah. Word. 
In Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors many times and in many ways through the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us through His Son. He is the one through whom God created the universe, the one whom God has chosen to possess all things at the end. And He goes on to describe the divinity of Christ. Now, is He saying that God thought of creation and that Jesus actually did the hands-on work? Uh, it something like that. We don't know exactly how that all worked out, but yeah, something like that. Um, and Hebrews 4.4, 4, God rested on the seventh day from all his work. Where do you suppose that comes from? Genesis. So, I mean, you go on. James 3.9, 2 Peter 3, Jude 11 and 14. It was not only the New Testament writers that gave reverence to God for his creative abilities, but also the angels in heaven reverence him. Look at Revelation 4.11. Our Lord and God, you are with, and this is, let's just back up a little bit. The four living creatures so forth, sing songs, etc. They throw their crowns down in front of the throne and say, Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory, honor, and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were given existence and life. Okay? Let's look at Genesis, I'm sorry, Revelation 10, verses 5 and 6. Then the angel that I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and took a vow in the name of God who lives forever and ever, who created heaven, earth, and the sea, and everything in them. The angel said, there will be no more delay. And in a book that is as unusual as the book of Revelation, you would think that... Uh, if it's going to be filled with so much unusual stuff that to refer to the classical um, Genesis report of creation would be different too. Yeah, yeah. When in 30 years ago in 1982, I experimented with, you know, a little marijuana here and there, and I inhaled, you know, uh, unlike our ex-president. <laughs> and and when I read Genesis, I used to think, okay, either John was a little off. I really did, or he should have let people know the kind of herb that was growing around, because it was scary to me, and it didn't make a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. But as time go went by, and I was able to connect from Genesis to Revelation and understand it better, I still don't understand it completely, but it makes more sense to me now. Yeah, there was a lot of people that said that there were some of these mushrooms. On yes, he had to be smoking and some. That they, <laughs> and that he ate those mushrooms, and it kind of made him, woo. But, you know, when you study yeah. Revelation, there's so much structure in it that there's just no way that yeah. a guy can, who's high could put out something like that. Yeah. The whole book is carefully designed in what they call a chiasm. Mm -hmm. Very carefully designed. And John, sorry to interrupt you, but John seems to be one of the favorites of uh, many readers of the Gospels. Mm -hmm. And so we'd have to throw out John. We'd have to throw out Paul. Paul. We have to throw out Luke. Almost the entire New Testament and most of the Old Testament. And most of the Old Testament. What do we have? Jesus. Yeah, we have to throw out Including Jesus. Including Jesus. Well, wow. he goes with the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, let's look at this again. <coughs> well, that's, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and why is it so... That's what happens. That's yeah. what they do. And evolutionists so are really, it is a religion to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, in fact, if Christians and believers would have as much fervor <laughs> in, in, their, in their position, imagine they were far li limitless or, yeah. uh, compared to what the evolutionist does. You can tell those sitting around the table here have a disposition to look upon evolution as a, as a spurious concept. <laughs> <laughs> so why is it so hard for scientists, the evolutionary scientists, to wrap their minds around the idea of creation? We've already talked about the two reasons. First of all, creation is a singularity. It only happened once and you can't go back and do it over again. You can't put it in your lab and try it five different ways or whatever. A second reason why creation is a problem for scientists is that is if the creation story is true as we believe, it was completely supernaturally caused. No human being was there in the planning committee. No human being stood up and said, I'm going to do it this way. It was completely an act of God. And science has now practiced, does its best to rule out 
any supernatural causes. We want to be in charge. We want to do this experiments that we can control. I kind of heard that that was part of the problem in the very beginning. There was somebody who was yeah. left out of the planning committee and who wanted to a participate, creature. a creature, <laughs> a created being, who wanted to uh, participate, and but God did it all. Yeah. But Ken, we're, we're saying that you can't do any supernatural um, um, I don't know, setting up of criteria, but didn't Gideon do that? Didn't he set up some criteria and say, look, if it's going to be, you know, if the fleece is going to be wet, then this is it. And then when it turned out to be something wasn't that sure. wasn't too sure, then he said, okay, we'll do it this way. So, so can we really say you can't? ask for supernatural experimentation or... Okay, if God appears to you and says, I have a task for you to do, and then you probably have the right to say, well, let me ask a few questions. Well, look at some few words from Ellen White. We're, we're running out of time. Men will endeavor to explain from natural causes the work of creation, which God has never revealed. But human science cannot search out the secrets of the God of heaven and explain the stupendous works of creation, which were a miracle of almighty power any sooner than it can show how God came into existence. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 89. Having now reviewed the teachings of all of Scripture, is there any evidence that the Bible writers were disagreed in their understanding of our origins? Do we, do we read any verses that disagreed with the general tone? Jesus himself clearly endorsed the authority of Moses and fully believed the story of creation, as we've already noted. Again, scan through Genesis 1 to 4. These four chapters describe the beginnings of almost everything that we know as human beings. There is God, the creation of our earth, the sun and moon, stars implying the creation of our universe. There is creation of life and this world as we know it. There is the beginning of sin and the beginning of the plan of salvation. These four chapters define who God is, what man is, what our relationship to each other should be. They define our ideal nature of reality. Man is given a role in ruling over and caring for this earth. So there's a lot that went wrong in those first four chapters that we know it. So many Christians, even those who believe in the creation account, have not thought through what the implications are. And I would like to challenge you to think about this. What implications are, what is implied by believing in creation what is implied by believing in evolution? Discuss it with your friends. We'll see you next week.